Hello. Hello. And welcome back to Strange Hungers. You Look have a little four square. You oh, oh we're so cute. We have four little faces. So little. Today. Um, BJ unfortunately is not going to be joining us. He's off at Renfair? No. Yes. yes. Yeah, looking, He's looking very Renfair. cool. Very handsome. Um, I don't You'll know. Why have we to... didn't get picks, so Look, VJ and I have a special <laughs> Unbelievable. Look, we just chat, it's fine. And it's our the only incredible we need. Our incredible Maddie boy is feeling a little under the weather, might be joining us later. But for the time being, you've got us. We're here to hang out, we're here to chat, um, talk about the past few episodes of Strange Hungers and how we've been doing. Um, my initial pitch was that we should talk about Strange Hungers AUs because I'm always in the mood <laughs> for a good fanfic AU. High school but, AU, go. High school AU, go. <laughs> but also, we're going to be taking any questions. So if you want to, if you're here and you want to throw any questions in the chat for us, just put question in all caps before your question and then your question and we will answer it. Who is the shepherd? Tell us now. Shepherd, <laughs> Shepard is, I don't, I feel like talking too much about Shepard is still major spoilers, but. Mm. Oh, oh yeah, I know. I'm messing. Shepard would probably be the science teacher who's doing weird experiments. Oh God, yeah. Oh, so this <laughs> is like a Riverdale style high school. Oh. Yes, definitely Riverdale. Um, what's the movie? Oh, yeah, I can absolutely see that. Sorry, there's a Korean zombie drama TV series that has like, a, like I'm a teacher who does that? Yes, thank you. That's him. <laughs> That's the shepherd. Perfect. Except yeah, I feel like that dude wild. has more... Yeah, I feel like that teacher has a little bit more empathy, though. There's some sympathy <laughs> there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People we were like, why are you Shepherd's keeping a student deal? in a cage in your classroom? That's fucked up. And he was like, she's a zombie, clearly. <laughs> and they're like, no, <laughs> what? Let her out. She's just having a bad happens. day. Leave her alone. I mean, <laughs> Shepard's like, they're all wild fucks. Yeah. No, oh, let them out. They need, they need to be um, contained. And by contained, I mean used for my purposes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. They, they, they run around murdering things. I want them to murder better. <laughs> we already know that Shepard has a, a big friendly pet dog so friendly not friendly it's not friendly i keep friendly? it is a friend it's very look, nice. look. It's not friendly and you cannot you can't you, you cannot start a DD game and not expect us to try and befriend the giant weird dog you can, you we can. can try we may not succeed <laughs> you, can, you can try as long as you'll you'll know that you're trying while there's like corpses that it's been eating and like people like dripping out of its mouth like you know, every, everything's got to eat you know, maybe I did in yeah. fact teach you. <laughs> yeah. And maybe the corpses are just being recycled. Well, the corpses yeah. used to be alive before they got in the mouth, is what I'm oh, saying. Oh, okay, 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 fair. Uh, like, all right, we have a question. <laughs> oh, we have a question. Okay, how horrifying is the molar bear, really? Uh, pretty, pretty terrifying. I will be frank. The molar bear is about 90% molars in my imagination, <laughs> so... The, the molar bear, that's actually a thing that you have stats for. Is that right? Yes. Wow. I still need you I, to send me this description. I do appreciate <laughs> your commitment to it's 80-90% 80, molars specifically. Like, yes. we don't have any incisors in there. It's strictly Which, back teeth. Strictly it just back needs, teeth. needs okay. help. <laughs> I want so it's just a okay. herbivore. It's grinding. Feet, <laughs> yeah. Face outward. Like, the entire... Shape of Does a bear. It roll? Is it like rolling on people? No, it has. It has. It's bear. crunch. Oh no! What you do is that you get two of them, and then they squish someone between them, and that's how they do it. Yeah, that's how they, they eat. Grunt. They just... One bear stands on top of the other yeah. bear and just rears up on its hind legs oh, over and over exactly. again. Is yeah. that is that molar bear love making? They just roll around on each that's other with reproduce. food between them. Them. It's just like teeth shards flying everywhere it's so cute <laughs> real cute do they feel nerve pain in the teeth is my oh guess. no Damn. do they floss uh, do they floss no absolutely not that's what the bodies are for <laughs> there's Damn. but the like other stringiness 10 percent are like probably sharper teeth 
Incisors? I feel like you got to have an incisor there somewhere. Yeah, like the claws are incisors. Is it like blind sight? Do they not have eyes? Is it blind sight? Oh, oh, oh. They, might, they might even be blind, I think. They're like I, they're like toddlers. They experience the world through their mouth. Yeah, I'm I, 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 that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love that. Um, oh, I need to do that. <laughs> we're going to kobolds in a trench coat. Could be. Could be. You don't know. I will say that Shepard... No, I won't say. I'm not going to say because we're so oh. close. We are so close <laughs> good, to actually good, good. meeting yes, Shepard. Uh, and I'm I'm very excited for it. I so. mean, do we want to share our current thoughts on what Shepard could be? Yeah, please go for it. Okay. My current theory is that the Shepard is an amalgamation of the dead gods like remnants of it pulling together and wanting to fuck the world up because it can mm -hmm. interesting or or alternatively someone who wants the the, the old gods to come back fully and is mm. like orchestrating it back mm. i've been watching a lot of owl house and like shira and that's my brain's just going looping into that i now. will say i do take a lot of inspiration both from shira and owl house my oh, good i love owl house i haven't watched um, owl house it's so good, it's so good. My current theory, I guess, is I, I don't have a very sexy theory about Shepard. Um, but my theory about Shepard is that they probably just started as some kind of regular person that was partially corrupted by the wild and then became really corrupted by the wild. And as you become more and more corrupted by the wild, maybe like you become more in tune with what the wild wants and so maybe shepherd is the ultimate um manifestation of the desires of the wild but put I onto what is left of a person you know if that makes sense Ooh, Who knows? fun mm -hmm. tasty what remains very tasty that is tasty. <laughs> alex just writing in the corner going, mm. <laughs> Let me take that down. You got a really good theory. Yeah. No, Alex is actually writing down kill Sarah. <laughs> um, I got like 20% right. Got too close. <laughs> My theory about Shepard was just um, I want Shepard to just be how they came out. They're just a guy out there guying and being who they are and us coming up to be like, you can't be this person. And Shepard be like, why not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I just, I just love the idea that shepherds just not not corrupted. That's just who they are. Yeah. Oh, fully. I, I mean, like because here's the thing: if if there's something that I have been getting the vibes from of this entire campaign, it is that, save for a few characters that we have met, evil is a lot more desire and need based than like corruptive based. Like it's something that was entombed in a jail for thousands of years for eating people is like, has no concept of the fact that they did anything wrong, you know? So like big vibes. I really appreciate that. Um, that is a really good thesis statement for how I feel about world building, especially in RPGs that have like come from more of a history of wargaming or exploitation um, because I think that examining the root of evil as what people want and what makes them do things is very important to me. And I've played some other games um, where the world building is maybe a little more stark or out there and evil has kind of more of an explanation um, or it comes like from the military history of a world mm -hmm. and then you know, there's more justifiable stuff where, you're, like, evil's born from a pumping heart in the middle of the planet, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people seem to equate evil with sentience, I think, mm. is a big thing. Whereas sometimes, you know, like, like Vio just said, is a lion evil for hunting for prey or is it just hungry? Like, there are some things that will kill us and you can't allow them to kill you. But, like, is that evil or is it just life it's it's, it's they're not sentient they're they don't have a concept of right or wrong a lion it's, is not also like instinct versus choice yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. which i think is very wild versus civilization mm -hmm. like what is what instinct I also, and can you sorry. choose instinct and what i also think is interesting about the lion concept is 
the lion isn't killing to be malicious. No. It's killing to survive, Hungry. too, right? So even if it did know right and wrong, it's like, it's the same thing where it's like, you have to kill something to live so that it doesn't eat you. It has to kill to eat. Mm -hmm. so, so that it doesn't die. So that it doesn't die. So both, when both people are just people, but both creatures are out there just trying to live, what does evil mean? Hmm. And the fun extra side of that is that when people are sentient and choose wrong for no reason other than to choose wrong, then we can hit yeah. those motherfuckers then right in the ass. Unions! <laughs> <laughs> All right, we um, had another well, question sorry. that I wanted sorry. to look at. Wait, no, you go yeah. see I'm looking. Only, so it's, it's a joke, but it's actually, uh, Shepard is just Siren in a coat. That's me. <laughs> That's a good theory. Siren in a coat? It's just Siren. Every time it's a villain, you know it's that Siren. You D&D game that we on, the, on the table when we first came into the Fulcrum Expedition? This is all just Siren playing out a really, really complicated LARP. <laughs> You're Pocket Master, baby! Uh, that's my favorite theory so far. Um, mm -hmm. Yo asked, tell us more about the dead gods the world is made of. I feel like I've definitely, um, I've said a lot both to my players and I've said a lot on stream, but I'm always kind of happy to talk about um, the, the, what are they called? I forgot. The Describe the what? The, the name the of God. The Decay Triad? The Decay Triad. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm always happy to talk more about the, the Decay Triad. The, I think it, um, they were inspired by a lot of, like, interesting divinity world building that I've seen. And I really wanted to have gods based around like themes or factions in a world. So again, we've kind of talked about this a lot, but the three, three of the big themes just in the world of Neum are uh, lust and greed. I have to, again, I'm a little out of it, so I'm gonna get, go get, back a, get up, get up, you little sheet. I have, I have a little cheat sheet. Widow sheet. I love that. Here we go. Look, I, I have a cheat sheet for all of novel stories. Everyone needs a cheat sheet. <laughs> Okay, I need to So, uh, Whisper, who I can actually just like read a little bit of this off. Um, so, Whisper is related to secrets and silence and memory, uh, keys and mind stuff, and kind of makes up both sleep and the astral plane. So, I've compared Whisper to the idea that um, if everyone's minds were sort of connected in a way, then that mind web, if it was sentient, would be Whisper. The Whisper is dead. So it, that's, um, you could imagine that like in a far, far millennia past, that Whisper might have been a fully connected hive mind that existed. And then like the decay of that is sentience as it exists in Neo. And That would have been so cool and fucked up. I know. Uh, that also kind of relates to some of the creatures in D&D, &D, like mind flayers and stuff, that have more of that, like, psionic stuff going on, so Whisper's a really good theme to pull from when I'm, if I, like, want to bring in any of those weird monsters. And Whisper is worshipped through deceit, so, like, lies, deceit, um, lying to yourself, things like that as well. Um, heat is worshipped through desire, so kind of rules over flesh, blood, lust, life, fire, emotions, passions. Um, most humanoids would do have some relation to heat, not really, again, religiously, but more like how they are kind of created or brought forth. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that because of like a mortality thing? Yes. Because, you know, living in passion because you've got, got so little life and you just, which is very contra- Contrapoint to the fact that, you know, Zedebi, Zed Zedebi. can't say it, thank you, um, is immortal, is effectively immortal. Like the idea of this immortal reigning over this uh, power of very mortal pleasure is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then finally, we do have Bone. So Bone is kind bone? of interesting. <laughs> bone. Sorry, every time you say Bone, that gift comes in my head. <laughs> because Bone, um, <laughs> in some ways is related to death, but any of the three of these could be related to death. We've seen Bone be more related to death specifically because of how Matthias's story has been built out. 
but bone is uh, related to cold, teeth, structure and permanence, architecture, rules over death and wealth, kind of a conception of Hades in some ways, but also is related to nature. So bone isn't strictly dead things or things that don't change and are like, you know, kind of left alone, but also is tied into uh, almost kind of what you were saying, Sarah, where the way that we might say a lion is alive, it doesn't have a certain kind of intelligence. Bone is really related to the way that things are instinctual versus ruled by like a decision, an emotional decision or a passionate decision. Um, and bone is worshipped through sacrifice. So sacrifice, desire, and deceit as my three big like themes that make up the way that this world is a little bit more horrific and desperate. I wanted to say love sex lies, but it's I guess um sacrifice sex lies. Yeah. <laughs> Good. It's sex lies and sacrifice. I I I would argue that it's also about rules. It is about huh. rules. Yeah. Bones about <laughs> rules and structure. Does, does devotion hit it the best? Because sacrifice, rules, I, structure, all of that is devotion to something that's very strict, mm. you know? I would say devotion, duty might be a little bit closer, duty. mostly because, again, bone duty. as it exists as a concept right now has been heavily influenced by... Duty is real good. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I also want to... I, I just... I, I, Tried to put the alignment onto my character and then got mm. sucker punched and I was like, Duty. no. Duty, I also devotion, deceit. Duty, devotion duty. To, to mortality and, you know, passion. and Devotion is loving. Well, I, I want to also tease out the diff... Because he said instinctual, but also a lot of people would argue passion is instinctual. So where mm -hmm. are we? where do we split that? I would say instinctual as it wow. comes more related to nature versus a humanoid instinct, mm. meaning that the way a plant grows towards the sunlight is an instinct in certain ways. And also, mm. what's that word that has to do with like um, propelling a motion and then staying in that motion until something stops it? Entropy? Entropy, yeah. I An think object entropy in motion stays is, in motion. Is big in the idea yeah. of this because the entropy of like everyone is moving towards death mm. uh, and then so um, Leo asks so yeah. the decay triad is whisper heat and bone and all other go go gods are aligned to each to varying degrees interesting well, I need enough. to make a joke about Maddie before we move on yes please do a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying there is that by not sleeping with the whole party Maddie's actually being a really good paladin yeah Doing so yeah. well. So much sacrifice. But only because he's a bone paladin. Every other paladin is bone paladin. <laughs> I know. <laughs> God, heat paladin. Like, it's part of the duty, oh, you know? <laughs> oh, my God. That's yeah. basically Taz, though. So, <laughs> to be in kind of an interesting way and to not quite limit it, um, what I've actually concepted is not that every other god falls specifically under a category of one, two, three whisper heat and bone but rather that in the death and dying of these gods that were so i mean we say i say gods but again these are like cthulhu like massive massive titans. absolutely crazy in titans yeah uh and the offshoot of that is actually just divinity like a step down is divinity mm -hmm. and then lesser divinity so a thing that is so powerful that it being dead is still a god basically um other gods come from but also have changed uh, in other ways from the actual decay triad so especially the way that there are some different religious practices across the world that are not really tied to like um a D, &D living god that talks mm -hmm. to you but for example uan Arbara is based way more on these uh, personal gods uh that are kind of not even quote a divinity but rather a sense of devotion to self uh choosing of a practice mm. that you devote yourself to or a goal or something you want to attain and then forming a relationship with that goal by uh, talking to a mentor who helps to guide you on a path to achieving sort of a form of self-fulfillment uh, there could be a thousand uh, 2,000 different gods of Uwanabara because 
these are very specific relationships with aspects of dirt. Me just smiling because we, we did that and that was so yeah. much fun. Uh, we had so much fun developing that. <laughs> like, and then I my the next question just for yes. whenever we're ready for it. <laughs> um, and then I, one other thing that that's related to is me trying to do a lot of research into different forms of religion uh, as they actually exist. So um, I have to go look it up because I want to make sure, but that does come from sort of a personal deity relationship from some of my research into, I think they're called Devi? Devi Davies and Davies. That's what Davies. you were. I was getting the vibes. I was like, oh, this sounds, this sounds familiar. Um, but then my question is how, how does the step down to like, let's say the, the Dave, the Davy tier from the primordial beings, like how did that happen? Did they, I, I guess, yeah, that's. Uh, it's kind of in the same way that D&D uh, &D world building uses a weave to represent like a force mm -hmm. of magic that exists across the world. I would say because Neum is made up of a powerful material that could be likened to divinity, there is almost a divine weave mm. kind of in this world. And so the four, I've always been really into the idea of like, the more you believe in something, the more powerful it is or the more it exists. The religious belief of people who hold like, take, uh, use these practices, actually manifests out of that sort of divine weave something that can fulfill their desires in a D D way. The the Davis and Davy thing is so interesting. So I'm not practicing religious, but my my mom is. Yeah. And then there's also the thing about like we're Jain, but then there's also like some crossover with Hinduism in terms of every family does have their own Davy. Mm. Uh it just so happens that my mom's maiden side and my dad's side both have the same one but um <clears throat> just to give you a little a little peep into our life yeah um my mom definitely made laura and me go to <laughs> go to a temple and she's like we gotta we gotta say what up to the family goddess um my so my family goddess is the is also called mother goddess the goddess of supreme power energy and invincibility and uh she is mounted on a line or a lioness depending on which, that's really uh, cool. That God sounds or, like she fucks. Also, I just love the concept of you and Laura going to your partner going to the the temple and be like, "What up, we gay?" And that's it. <laughs> just like we did it. <laughs> Listen, uh, as it turns out, like you know, like in a lot of cultures, uh, all sorts of sexuality much more common before uh, the Brits came in, fucked yeah. it all up for everybody. Yeah, lady on a lion. Fuck uh, you, colonizers. Some pretty mm -hmm. cool and gay to me uh yeah, mm -hmm. sarah did you want to read that question yeah uh <laughs> from vo are there any prominent philosophical factions that are like mm -hmm. i don't believe in the gods i mean they exist but they're just extremely powerful mages fuck off i'm not devoting myself to that i don't know about factions but hi and welcome to the entire concept that i based my character around yes uh, uh because there are gods in the world that are not your typical D&D, &D, like, they have a face. You can talk to them. They actually manifest miracles. There is more space for a, like, lack of belief in deities. I will say uh, as well, because I have tied religious practices more to countries than to um, races, as they are typically tied in D&D. &D. Uh, I wanted to give more space for the way that gods might manifest differently in these different countries. So, especially in Abjur, which does kind of, by its nature, it is kind of one of the oldest areas in terms of the stuff that exists, like, you know, these old ruins and things, and it's it's passed between the hands of multiple different empires, etc. Um, the gods have more of a presence every day. So I would say that they're... There are less um, agnostic factions in Abjur, but rather factions that interpret the gods differently than someone, say, of the Raj might. And we've seen that in Tazriel's backstory, where he has faced off against these cults that interpret heat or bane as sort of more of a, like, devouring passion, like eating of life, cannibalism, dark, like that kind of thing. So, again, Abjur, maybe not as much. There are people who uh, 
would not be as affected necessarily by the gods, um, or not really talk to them directly, especially because, again, divinity is literally in the bloodline of many of the Raj, so they might be kind of occupying the time of the gods a little bit more in that country than um, those who are not, like, of a, a rural heritage. But in, again, Uwanobara, or in, um, especially in the wastes, I would say, you might have, like, People who say, the gods aren't real, I live in a frozen hellscape, no one's protecting me, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, definitely, definitely the case, but off the top of my head, I don't have any particular name for that faction. Huh. And I think, I think a very neat way of interpreting, like, I suppose, atheism in a very god-present world, because even if it's like, yeah. oh, the gods don't exist in this world... I mean, I guess you maybe wouldn't have knowledge of the Raj, but like the Raj does kind of exist as a very clear example that there are gods, which leaves mm. for realm of a very fun take culturally of like, sure, there are gods, but just like Alex said, their time is occupied and that's shitty. So I don't like them, which is <laughs> my character. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there like, are plenty uh, of other, um, I mean, just because Vio did mention, like, oh, they're wizards, or oh, they have knowledge, uh, there are, there are ways that a form of education in this world might lead you to question the gods more, simply because learning about, like, um, some elemental planes or other sources of magic, you could certainly look at the Raj and say, like, that, that isn't actually divinity, that's a highly, like, adapted form of magic that comes mm -hmm. from somewhere, and then they are claiming to be divine because they have that magic. Exactly, yeah. Because I think, didn't, did I ever do a, a monologue about that, or did I just think about it in my head really hard? <laughs> I think I said it to Tyra, right? I think you said something. That the gods were just creatures who had more effectively tied themselves into the weave than yeah. what we know as humans or people had done so far, so... I think there's room for that. I think we got another question. We've got two. Um, question from Vio. Can you actually alter a god by altering their worshippers' beliefs of it en masse? Which is yeah. really, I love that. I love um, that, that so would, much. That is more the case in Mizande, actually. Mizande yeah. is, again, an entire continent. Um, that's the name of the continent. So cool. There are multiple other countries in Nizande. I haven't fleshed it out as much. Nizande is also a place that um, I care about representing either through sensitivity consultants or players who uh, I want I want it to be influenced more by more research. And I haven't spent a lot of time there. I was working on I was doing a campaign in Nizande, and it uh, kind of took place like on the edge of Nizande, a port that is very influenced by. The relationships with external like mm -hmm. countries back on Sinolji, which is the continent we have spent most of our time on. Uh, but Nizande currently is very based in a magical hierarchy and mm -hmm. also does have some aspects of animalism in it, but rather a belief that divinity pervades through animal life, plant life, any living any living being, and doesn't manifest as much um, in a way you could talk to face to face. But Izande is kind of moved and shaped by, uh, in terms of it being a majocracy, is I have pictured sort of these collectives of belief that then are able to manifest things. So rather by um, like cutting down swaths of forest to create a new town, you might simply gather a large enough group of people to believe a town should be there and then the plants will move mm. out of the way oh and then you would call that, that is a dope. divine miracle that's it's cool. a something for sure <laughs> yeah i love that anime uh. yes i think that it is it's there uh hmm, are there any big god level creatures or forces that the party are going to completely miss that you want to shout out mention um Definitely. There are a lot back on Sinology, and we've we've moved to Valkyrie now. Um, and we're going to be spending a lot of time here because this is a waste expedition. But there are a lot of interesting, fun forces 
uh, specifically in the Ungekwan as an area that I mm. really enjoy and have a lot of fun with, that I've seen a lot of, like, big, deep forests that are kind of like the ocean, and they get more and more wild creatures as you go deeper into them. There are a lot of big, crazy creatures in the Ungekwan, especially the deeper that you go. There's a place called, I think it's called the Grove of Antlers that's on the map somewhere, that has some, like, giant giant deer skeletons like the size of a mountain deer skeletons whoa and yes they like give me giant animals creatures that move through the forest so um that kind of thing that's super big uh also the desert um Bajau, uh, it isn't all desert there's more like kind of coastal um jungle-esque regions on the coast but Bajau has a lot has a, again kind of relationship with divinity also a relationship with the wild the way the mild wild manifests in bajau are these sandstorms that sweep over and they have these walls that are like they kind of break the way that the sandstorms manifest but the sandstorms will change things in their wake so um they might like change the sand into a different material they might change the creatures that live in that area into something different and and make them stranger um but you also have a big legacy of like, snakes and worm creatures. Another reason that maybe it's good we're not spending a lot of time there because we don't really do snakes as much in this. But, yeah. Hell I'm yeah. Just, I'm just enjoying watching you explain stuff. It's so good. I know. It's so I good. love your world so much. I don't want it to just be me answering questions. I want I want yeah. questions for my, my players are, as well. Uh, I'm just so grateful. It's so to good. take it back to the high school AU, yeah. Alicia oh. would be that character from the Breakfast Club that gets the makeover at the end, except that they never do the makeover. <laughs> a weird one. <laughs> Just the weird one. A weird one. Perfect. Oh. High school AU. What would Kara be? Uh, not a nerd. <laughs> Too dumb. I think Kara's just the... Uh -huh one popular girl that's actually really nice genuinely yes and uh like that loves gets hard helping. <laughs> <laughs> and is like unironically like the head of the like aspca and like does a lot of volunteering and you're like what the fuck why i knew that does all the cool. organizing organizing for the gsa yeah yeah and you're just like but you're also popular and you're not doing this for college credit i don't yeah, understand very rich. i must admit i do think kiara would be on the lawyer track not because of you Pooja, <laughs> but rather because i think she would be one of those like volunteer um mm, like criminal justice <laughs> well she probably does volunteer but the the thing is she's being held back is that she's she's got a lot of good intentions but she's not got a lot of brain like she could not yeah. be in a debate club he has too much, she has so much heart and affection that the people on the lower track are like, she won't last. You know what she like, is? She's a volunteer she, she, organizer. She's, yeah. She is the volunteer organizer. She's like, we're you gonna go. a little clipboard with a little tiger clip on it. We're gonna like, save the whales. Got a little cat ponytail through her big yeah. beautiful hair. Like, like, and you, like, Kiara is the person that actually convinces people to give them their emails for, like, <laughs> yes, yes. reading the list because she's so nice, and so but funny. genuinely. And then she'll say, like, on her phone, like, do you want to see a picture of my cat, Agnita? Yeah. Isn't she cute? <laughs> no, but look I at this whale. Don't you want to save the whales? Mm-hmm. Big eyes. And we do. We do. Because it's Kiara. The problem is They're... that Kiara probably also has um like a super wealthy parental figure who yeah. is like oh owns a corporation <laughs> yeah oh but i'm just imagining that like kiara is like goes home to an empty house because her dad's yeah. always away doing other yes, stuff yeah. and her mom's yes. not there and she has a nanny Wait, and like literally. she's all happy and then comes into the house she's like kiara's basically an exxon like you know one of the exxon family <laughs> But yeah. like they're out there doing their thing, that, and she's like trying to save the whales. Um, what's that fancy wine country that uh, rich Napa people go Valley? to? 
Napa country. Valley. The whole country? No, it's not called. It's not country. It's called like something country, I think. Or oh, something. wine country. This is is Napa wine country. Yeah. It's just yeah, wine yeah. country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's like a direct parallel between Kiara's father in campaign and Kiara's father in AU, where he spends all of his time just, doing like, business in Napa. <laughs> doing business in Napa. <laughs> I love that. Oh, what is novel? Mm-hmm. What is what is bugged in? So Baden, see, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of how you would equate the shiftery aspect in like oh no this is still they're fine for some reason i was like human are you um but uh definitely is the child of the librarian at the school so is there most days trying to help that her dad out like making sure everything's okay but she is the jock yeah. She is like basically i'm imagining if matthias was like captain of the football team um like bardem was next bardem yeah. was trained to be next like next in Barton's line quarterback yeah yeah, yeah. But i do not know football terms but that sounds pretty Barton good quarterback hits because <laughs> like barden in a jersey with a big stick that is the sword and it's like titan's wrath is the no wait yeah the stick in football I, uh, okay Barton, okay Barton, captain of the lacrosse team matthias captain of the football team uh see, I was gonna say yeah, Barton's, yeah. Barton's giving me wide receiver yeah. Ooh, not quarterback. Arden does have wide receiver vibes. But I don't know what that means, but you fast, you run far, and you catch the ball. Novel human would be actor, like would be yes, be it a kid, yeah. be, be it a kid. kid. Mm-hmm. Big. Um, but also uh, fucking up the whole. You, you know, a jock is mean. Just like, but Barden is a him. Barden's making sure people are going okay on the way to class. Like, if Barden knows that there's a kid that's getting bullied, like, she will walk them to class and just be like, yeah, they're my friend. Yeah, you're like, you can borrow my fucking jacket. You can borrow my jacket. You know, give it back to me at the end of school. We're cool. Barden is that nice jock who is a jock only because she's good at sports and not because she wants jock culture. Right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that Barton does, like, the maybe it's more novel coming from, like, I want to be a knight. Like, I want to be a bro so bad, but they kicked me out. Yeah. They kicked me out of the bro squad. (laughs) Two deaths. Refused to shove someone in their locker. Yeah. 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 Look, look, they, they, but they, they don't need to do it if they deserved it. Cause it's that still that whole. No, they, somebody was like, shove this kid in a locker. Oh, and yeah, they didn't do no anything way. wrong. And Bart's like, no. He's like, well, you're not cool enough to hang out here. But you're you're still on the team because you're real fucking good mm-hmm. at what you do. You're really good, but but Jeez. also Bart and going to in, at lunchtime, going to the library to make sure their dad's okay. And yeah. <laughs> Cute. Um, I do I think Barden like helping out kids with homework. Uh, I can see that. Oh God, Barden not doing unpaid tutor labor. Yeah. Barden, no. <laughs> oh, this is this is the genesis of Barden and Kiara's friendship because Kiara definitely needs that tutoring <gasps> help. Oh, Jesus. oh my God, yes. Oh my God, uh, yes. <laughs> I also think Oish is at all times at risk of getting a truancy charge, but does always show up and get <laughs> hundreds on tests. <laughs> yes, is almost never at school perfect that they, they would kick them out if they didn't need them so bad yes <laughs> yeah you're you're oh, basically the, the uh sorry oasis is like the um got like the got crazy high scores on the psats and now has like that full uh scholarship coming in and it's just like we need it's gonna look so good for the school. It's gonna look really good graduate. for the school like this this future like road scholar yeah. He's an asshole, yeah. but we need their name attached yeah. to the school. And also, like, one teacher found out that the reason they're never there is because they work, like, two to three jobs outside yeah. of school. Yeah. And so that's why they're never there, because they take everything home to their family, and they're like, I can't get that kid in trouble. They're an asshole, but I can't do it. I know. Is the waste, like, selling drugs? Outside oh, waste is 100% selling drugs. Is this, is this like, Fair Street? Like Fear Oasis, uh, oh. if you guys, it's the Goosebumps it. TV series. It's very gay. Oh, it's I thought you were going to talk about the books, and I was like, oh, you mean the, book, not... the horror books I was raised on? Please continue. Yeah, there's a. It's on Netflix. There's three different kind of movie oh, like yeah. things. It's I'm, real I'm good. Sure it's good. I'm showing my it. age by being like the books. <laughs> <laughs> I never read the Goosebumps books because they generally the, the covers scare the fuck out of me. 
um See, like they look so spooky <laughs> by the time i had access to the books i was a little bit older for goosebumps so fear streets if there's still rl stein it's just fear street is his like high school series um <laughs> and so i went straight into fear streets and i went hard I'm mm. so sorry. Uh, Oish would sell weed and add a robot in the bike. It's, yeah. so, it's so true because, like, <laughs> yeah, high school AU Oish does definitely have a diagnosis and prescribe for ADHD. They do not take their meds, they do sell them for money. Like, uh, okay, so wait, now we've just created a trope in which Oish and Kiara's character have to get together in this AU because, like, come on. <laughs> has to get has, sells sells the adderall to kiara yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i'm just like uh, the high school sweetheart and the high school delinquent right but i also kiara do think good. i do think that their unlikely friendship does end in like uh kiara has all those protests for like save the whales and things and then assholes come and then suddenly they're just taken care of and you're like <laughs> yeah convenient <laughs> oh uh. Then were you gonna say something? Uh, we've got we've got like two questions. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. no worries, no worries. I, I was catching up with all the silly. I love it. Uh, this is from Vo. Uh, question: Barovia exists in this world in the in the Unget Kwong, so presumably Strahd exists. This begs the question: Have any of your players tried to punt that bastard into the Never Realm like the little prick he is? Hmm. Though interestingly enough, uh, although I have run Curse of Strahd back in my college days i didn't run curse of strahd as it is set in my world now uh so my form i started running actually this is a little sad i started running a curse of strahd campaign for people in my house uh, i think it was my junior year of college i lived in something called the music house which is like a, a themed house for people who did like radio dj yeah. um and it was really fun, and I started running a campaign of Curse of Strahd for people who had never played D&D before, and I made a bunch of meme characters. It was very fun and very silly. And that was meant to be the introduction of me placing Barovia into my world, but the campaign never went anywhere because we were playing in person and the pandemic hit. So I did get to, like, finish that off. Actually, that might have been my sophomore year. No, that was my junior year. Anyway. Uh, so Barovia as it currently exists, Strahd has not been based against players from Neum yet. Uh, I am excited for it and I do have plans for it. I don't have a fully fleshed out concept yet because I really like the weird shadow film mechanics and especially um, the newer D&D book, which I forget, I forget what it's called, but it has a bunch of like the horror realms as they exist and I think I would really enjoy playing around with those mechanics and Neum, but I haven't gotten a chance to yet. Also, considering how the Ngekwon is like down here and we are up here, I just love the idea of Strahd somehow just whoop. Yeah. Like, hey! <laughs> oh, interesting. cold! <laughs> I decided to take the mist as it exists in uh, Curse of Strahd as like this kind of present force that really like turns people around. It is more sentient in certain ways than just regular mist and make that actually into a god, like a god of illusion and deception. So. <laughs> The mist is again tie probably tied to Whisper, but the mist has got to be a Whisper exist connection in other places. Yeah. Also, just imagine a traveling mist if you just across an entire continent. Just like, don't mind me. Just, just, mm -hmm. just don't look at the mist. <laughs> Ignore the mist. <laughs> um, there was another one. Question okay. from Vo again. How did the Iran Albaran War start? And was it a sort of mini World War One in terms of the being the first mechanized all out war? So again, okay, this is something else that I haven't deeply written into, but I will say that most of the advancements um of the Iran Albara, the most significant ones have happened since the war ended with that mm. treaty and with the um marriage and alliance between the two characters that we saw in Strange Hungers. Uran Albara becomes much more uh, technologically advanced in the next 80 years, as we have seen in some other campaigns that I've run offline. Um, <laughs> like with Shan's character, for example. <laughs> so uh, although we do have guns currently, and we do have sort of like flying ships and hot air balloons and, and stuff in Uran Albara, um, eventually there will be a train network that gets developed <gasps> from the Uran Albara. Just a, lo a lot of stuff that kind of comes out. But you are in the first 
15 or 20 years of that actual alliance. Like, this mm. is a very recent thing that has happened. Um, right. That war has recently ended. It was stalling out, like you aren't coming off of, okay, 20 years ago, there was an actual war. We had uh, characters from the campaign who were in Aronobara, like, as the war was ending, but not actively, like, you know, seeing front line kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I believe, uh, as far as I kind of have it in my brain right now, Uwarnabara was a resource for most significant. Mm -hmm. Uwarnabara doesn't have, like, it has some farmland, but it's kind of caught between the Abishore, which has, like, the most farmland of any of these countries, and the coast. Both Uwara and Albara have access to coastal areas, but... Um, again, I have to kind of check. One of them is a lot more swampy and doesn't really have, you know, like good access to water and also is more significantly affected by some of the wild storms that happen in that region. Um, like we have the Yungek one kind of coming down to the coast and I think it's Uwara is more like actively plagued by the Yungek one on one side and then wild storms and then weird swampy stuff. And so in a resource war, trying to expand trying to grasp um the technology actually ends up becoming a way that they work on fighting back against the wild in that country and therefore like helping each other out with it. yeah i think there's another question but i've just had a thought that has just been like ringing through my head for like the last 10 minutes and now i'm just thinking we're getting dragged along to the waste due to the shepherd's actions i think the shepherd might want us to dig something up because we are, you know, we're a discovery, right? We're we're an, we're a group that's trying to discover new shit. I th I feel like we're getting drawn to something. Sorry, that's just been. As Alex has said many times, and I've always pushed against every time, we are the doomed fulcrum expedition. Yeah. Expedition. You are doomed. We yeah. Are not... You are so doomed, but it's. We are it's only older. doomed in one timeline, Look, and I will doomed... find the other one. <laughs> Yeah, Look, doomed is according to who wrote it, right? Mm -hmm. So we could still all be alive. It's just whoever wrote it said we were doomed. Siren That's wrote true. it. I was about to yeah. say it was fucking Siren. Hey, and to maybe... be honest, I'm I'm fully expecting it to be like Siren would do that so Novel could go be free and do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah, we discovered some guards and shit, and <laughs> yeah, we don't we want need... anyone to repeat this. This is witness they protection. Were this is witness protection, man. <laughs> All of this being said, you're reminding me of something that I actually wanted to bring up, which is one of the things that I'm going to start kind of pushing for or leaning into more is actually having the Fulcrum Expedition send more information back. I think we've mm -hmm. talked about that you might have like sent some letters or things, but actually like starting to pay off your expedition uh, advance, <laughs> basically, by sending information. And I think that will give me a fun gameplay loop of... The information you send back, I can then use to direct you or like say, okay, you know, the ful fulcrum ends up researching the information you sent them and then giving you clues of oh. where to find Cool. Hell yeah. I could definitely do that. We can definitely do that. Okay, I think we got some questions. Uh, the kind of a nitpicky geography question. If you go further into the waste, is it technically a desert the same way Antarctica is? Uh, yes. The... Valkyrie as it exists is a frozen continent that is connected to an ice sheet. So they are currently on continent. Deeper onto Valkyrie is ice sheet, and then beyond that, people don't really know. You have you like you've heard the term lava zone, but it's unknown. <laughs> it's, it's gonna be like, a giant body of something. Come on. Is it Get like, in the it's known. unknown? That's what I want. Lava That's what I want. Even. So, kind of, yes, a desert, but more literally, like, yeah, Antarctica. Nice. And then... Yeah, uh, exactly that. I was gonna get on start playing. I am... I would so love to. I have been very busy, unfortunately, with a lot of cool, fun job stuff, but I do hope at some point to go back to, like, pro GMing and paid GMing, because I am a big fan. Yeah. Um, this is your prompt to tell us about the queer punk rock NB Rod. Yeah! <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. um, Ere, I think their name is Ere. Uh, -huh. uh, this character came up again in Siren's Quell, which was- I was about to say, I recognize the name. Yeah. Uh, and... Siren's Quell is a campaign that I was running with Shan and some other friends from home. Um, just like, 
scattered friends uh, that I've met across fun. the internet and involved characters who were graduating from Ignis Royal Academy. And they got to interact with a lot of royalty and royal descendants from Abjur because Ignis Royal Academy is like in the capital, genre, huh? Mm -hmm. So Ere uh, is just sort of a fun, like, sapphic angel lesbians um, exist in this royal family and like they can have kids. Ere is an adopted kid who actually still ends up getting the powers of the Raj, which is meant to be like, you can be adopted into the Raj family and still be their descendant. Hell yeah. Because yeah. I say so. Hell oh, yeah. Love that shit. Do we still have, and they have a band? Of that? And they have a band. There were recordings. We had a few audio burned. recordings from like one mm -hmm. or two episodes. But mm -hmm. I wish we had more because I um I it was invented so good a, listening to them back. I invented a game called the Decathlon. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah, it was like Ninja Warrior dungeon crawling. It was seriously so good. It was so full of puzzles. And my character was using uh my character was Thorn, who is an artificer who uses a uh fighting wheelchair, which was uh, you can find it online. It's really, it's not called the fighting wheelchair. Oh, the dislocating GM's wheelchair. combat wheelchair. Yeah, it's the combat wheelchair. It was so good. Yeah. It was so fun. Oh, it was such a good game. And it was actually, the, the building we were transported to was in the waste. It was in the waste, yes. Which I remember when we started talking about the waste and going, what, this cool building might be there? There might be someone living in it. Instead, it's abandoned. I really cool. wanted to have a dungeon crawl in that campaign, but it didn't make a lot of sense to do a dungeon crawl. So I ended up building a like two teams compete to beat a dungeon first, and then at yeah. the end they fight each other. That's tight. We won though. I remember my team won. I balanced it a little at, weirdly the first time. Uh, <laughs> it worked out very well, but I would I would love to run it again. It was a great time. It was yeah. very fun. I mean, that could be like a one shot one time, right? That could be a someone isn't oh, here yeah. and we could do That'd a decathlon. That'd be so silly. I also, the way I ran it had a lot of NPCs in it, which I think ended up bloating the combat a little bit. Um, so I would probably do. I would like, I've seen a lot of really fun stuff from unpaired casters and the way that they do like these really big groups of people and run them and how they've been working on that. I think it's something that I'd love to try at some point, like helping mm. to GM a really big group of people. It's a different skill set, but it's it's very enjoyable. It's very, very, neat. very cool. Yeah. Um, any other stuff that y'all want to talk Marshall's about? But in questions the for me. Yes. Hmm. Like questions for each other, questions for me. Hmm. How's the campaign gonna end, Alex? Um, it's due. When's our next level up? <laughs> uh, further now. I haven't even chosen all of my things. But <laughs> you still have, up? like, things to pick. I still uh, have to pick my second spell. The way that I think this campaign ends, to be honest, is that I think we get to a point where I, that I want to reach for, like, a big boss battle or a resolution. And I, I'm expecting, um, and I'm hoping we'll still all want to play together, I'm expecting that we will end up playing something else for a bit, or playing around in the world a little bit, maybe switching out to GM, or bringing in one or two players, depending on our availability, like, just kind of figuring something like that out, and then revisiting the Strange Hungers characters more in the future, and doing a wrap-up, like, few-month campaign epilogue. That's how mm. I actually picture it. That sounds, sounds really well. cool. E. Who's your character's current crush? My character's? Oh, oh, yes, your character's. <laughs> uh, I mean, we could ask with... Siren, but... <laughs> Shepard. Shepard? Shepard? Uh, Shepard currently has a crush on... They're looking for love, y'all. On who? On uh, no one, they're looking for love. Oh, damn. I just, you muted I just out love right that. You, you muted no it. It's like you managed to like bleep yourself I out. It, yeah. it was great. <laughs> uh, who does Kiara currently have a crush on? Uh, well, it's pretty obvious Kiara has a massive crush on Maddie. Yes. But I also think Kiara has 
baby crushes on everybody else. It's just Maddie is a safe one to crush on, if in in a way, because like I think in her head it's least likely to happen because of how reserved mm. he is. So it's kind of that like safe Same. crush. Mm -hmm. Whereas if Kiara openly had a crush on anyone else, it might not be as like idealistic and distant in that way. I really like that. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, the sense of like getting a lot of emotion from like a big crush that's far away, but an actual relationship that could happen is uh, complicated. Yeah. yeah. And like the the type of crush Maddie, uh, Kiara has on Maddie is, is, is kind of safe and because it's not going to like cause discord in the group or like mess up how everybody functions together or anything like that at least in its current state that's big yeah, yeah. tasty uh what about novel i have so many thoughts um ready for them let's go I, again i feel like for novel it's hard to have crushes i think uh when they were younger they definitely had a crush on soren definitely a thing and then because i i've talked to alex about this and yeah. i just realized i had this moment of one day novel had to go to their dad and go i can't be in love i can't do that i can't do that i have to put on a face like i can never love soren and i i just remember thinking this moment with mountain who is aromantic just having to try and soothe his child who is brokenhearted that they can't have the romance that they've read about in so many stories um so the idea of like i think novel can have a very distant idea of a crush they can maybe have the vague emotions of it but they can't really settle in and the idea to be honest out of everyone in the group to be honest they all know novel now but kiara has been the most openly accepting and I think if one was to grow, I think it would be Kiara. Um, That's a really good. Answer. Also, also Barden definitely had a crush on Matty when she was younger because it's like big night, really cool, was really nice to me, and wasn't mean when I knocked him down. Um, so that also happened. Um, but yeah, for, for novel, it's hard. Um, like some of the stories can be flirty, and that's fun, and like they enjoy the concept of doing that. But, yeah, love is hard. Love is hard when you can't show someone your face without them screaming, you know? Which, <laughs> big, big trans vibes, baby. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's also that, like, I've definitely said that Novel can't, like, kiss, doesn't have lips, so someone's gonna have to deal with that. <laughs> like, I forgot about that. I mean, some people aren't into kissing. It's fine. But, but yeah. It would be a lot of it would be a lot of nuzzling, which mm -hmm. you know they would still they would still try. You know, they still try and copy a lot of humanoid aspects. So, but that's yeah, fine. let's yeah. There's a lot of also like fun, interesting, cute, romantic things you could do as a changeling with like oh, the yeah. knowledge of a partner. I I have so many fun yeah. I have so many fun thoughts in that direction, and I have yeah. talked to VJ about these because it's fun. <laughs> VJ um, is so excited for the time that like that Taz gets over his deal about novel, and I'm just like, hurry up, because then we can have fun with this. Come on. <laughs> good shit. What about a wish? What about a wish? Uh hmm. I mean. I don't know if a wish has crushes as much as they have like tiers of things that they would do with certain people, if that makes sense. So obviously Siren. Uh, Vice and Laura are big contenders right now. Um, they think they're both super tight. Uh, but that's more of like, a, I really want to like talk to you. And if that also meant that we boned down, great. Uh, but... I think the term of like, this is someone that I feel strangely about, and also I think they need a good, a good time, is Matthias. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a crush. 
Uh, but it feels weird. It, uh, Hawaii just feels too tired to have crushes, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Although we originally concepted Oish in a way that they like are still kind of coming into adulthood and, and mm -hmm. have some forms of naivete. And that has changed over the course of the campaign. Yeah, it just doesn't, it didn't fit well with party dynamics. Um, it, it already, I think, was being occupied in a few spaces that felt like it would be redundant to have a wish occupy it as well. Um, yeah. So I think we ended up going with more of a, they are, they do in some ways have like a skewed understanding of the world that makes them fuck some things up. But when it comes to like understanding romance, I think they are very mature in that like, I mean, Oasis is polyamorous. So um, they're like, these are the stages of involvement that I would have with these people, you know? So yeah, yeah. that's them. And it's think... interesting as well because um, Awish comes with, just because they're an older character, technically, uh, more stages of like romance they've gone through. And I think the closest to that that we have is probably Tazriel. Tazriel mm -hmm. as someone who like, had a significant mm -hmm. partner that probably would have been his life partner and then lost them. And that is pretty close to Awish. Yeah. But canonically, I did say, and I do still hold to this, that Awaish did not get to bone down for 40 years. So when they first came to this campaign, they were like, who? Who among <laughs> you will sleep with me? <laughs> <laughs> so there's that element. That's great. I mean, there is also the group, silly group phrase that is of course when the group gets together all of them yeah we of course have that in the back of our mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of course we do <laughs> like, have total here's the poly kiss. yeah total body kiss the interesting um... thing is although i do think like it could happen in some way it could happen the dynamic of the characters um we we all really enjoy a little bit of drama and we've all really enjoyed digging into the ways that these characters are different from each other and the way that their like culture and background have made them different i think these characters are as likely to become like a true party like a party at the end of a campaign where you are you are tied together you are sworn together you would do anything for each other no matter what like you love each other so deeply um or like become enemies become significant forces in the world that although they respect each other as like having gone through a journey are diametrically opposed mm -hmm. and that's a really interesting place to be in that's so really fun uh i was typing this in the chat but i'll just say this now uh someone said i feel like oh would like certain forms of kink because they live with clear guidelines and boundaries canonically fact thing i've never said Oish <laughs> likes sex better than other forms of human interaction because good sex has a lot of boundaries and guidelines and structure. It's great. Free negotiated, so baby. Yeah. Tools, communication. So good. Yeah. Okay. I, um, I have also a question. In. Yeah, please. Oh, this is non-related. Yeah. Well, it's, it's still within the world. Um, which you can you can say no and tell me to ask in, in play. Um does is is titan's wrath aware the novel is not a few of you is she just dumb or is she just you, you know the idea of like um determined that this person is few of you it's gotta be otherwise i will i will talk about it because i think it's interesting to bring up titan's wrath is reacting to something in novel's backstory Ooh. that shan okay, knows so and no one else knows so i'm hinting mm. i'm hinting at this here that uh titan's wrath does have a like reason to call novel their master but it, oh yeah is also just dumb like 
<laughs> um, it's also dumb as a pile of rocks. Yes, it's not like I'm <laughs> really not charismatic. Here rock. <laughs> that novel is actually like related to the fever. Fe like the sword has a like a reason and is dumb enough to think that like you look like fever few. Good enough for me. Good enough for me. Like, dumb, but also a little something. Okay. So I was wondering if, like, she's ever seen novel change shape and been like, doesn't sound right, but I don't know enough about it to dispute it. Yeah. <laughs> um, another, I don't know enough about Fever Few. <laughs> another way that I have concepted this sword is that although the sword, like, has sort of a, a vision sense, right? is very different from Darren, for example, where Darren has sort of a consciousness that then, like, perceives and relays information. I think the sword has something more like what you might say, like, you know how animals have certain sort of different forms of vision and, like, other mm. one sense is way more important to them? Vision is not the primary way that Titan's Wrath sees. The, like, elements of, of fighting is more what the sword is kind of built for. So, like, how can I fight you is more mm. what they see. Hmm. Sorry, the qu one the question is, but is novel fever for you though? Board paradox. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say this. I actually, I'm, I feel like I'm comfortable saying it. One, one of the, the reasons is the 20 strength. Like, oh. novel having 20 strength make, like, that is something the sword perceives as the same. Mm. Ah. You are strong enough to wield me. You are my master. That's tight. Holds it safe from Matty. You've got your own sword. <laughs> like, I, I think that... You've got your own cursed sword. sword. If yeah. Matthias picked up Titan's Wrath, attuned to it in a certain way, and then was like... And not Matty was like, I'm fever for you. The sword would be like, you, okay, like, you could yeah, be. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> you know. I think there... <clears throat> I think there might be some problems with that. I don't think that your sword would like me. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, um, actually, I... yeah. No, I was just going to say, what would it? Because you know, we have the thing of uh, everyone being attuned to uh, one of the DK triad. What would Titan's Wrath be attuned to if you put it in a box? Probably Ooh. bone, most likely. Oh. Yeah, yeah, structure rule. Would make sense rules. to see the few. Um, worship through sacrifice as well. Like, hits mm. on Titan's Wrath. Yeah. Cool, thank you. I am I'm gonna ready. let Chester in. Yeah. Let the boy <laughs> in. Sloan, are you here? What's Maddie in the AU? I mean, he's probably a jock of some kind, right? Yeah. Mm. He's so sweet, though. Yeah. He is, I feel like he is the meathead jock, but without the bullying. He's the meathead jock who's also somehow been convinced to um, be head of student council. Um, yes. He's, he's in, he's in mock you. He's doing it. And like, suddenly has just way too much responsibility he never yeah. actually asked yes. for. Yeah. He gets like half an hour of relaxing time and it's just... Sad. I'm sitting on a beanbag. Yeah, <laughs> just going, slowly, uh, slowly uh, eating a piece of cut fruit from a bag. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I'm when... imagining boiled eggs for some reason. Boiled eggs in a bag because it's fruity. Oh my god! <laughs> I just oh, Vice that is would the be... weirdest thing I could think of. Vice would be the hottest PE teacher in the oh, yeah. world. Yes, she yeah. wears little shorty shorts. Yeah. Oh wait, she does hit. On it's on the team. In the high school <laughs> Oh my god. Um, Maddie's too thick for the track team. Oh, he's so Maddie's strange. like an offense offensive lineman. Does he do actual wrestling as well? Oh <laughs> Maddie is a wrestler. That little onesie. Mm -hmm. That cat is so yelling. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't hear her. We've got some more questions. Yeah. Uh, I feel like this is you and Sarah. Uh, Darren is the best okay. NPC in the campaign. How'd the conversation between Sarah and Alex go when Jenning Darren? I'll wait for Sarah to get back for that. Let's do... Okay, um... we can do... Uh, Matty strength. Are we going to see the word reacting to... The word reacting to his unnatural strength? The world? The world? Yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah. 
I... Oh, I mean, there are other forms of unnatural strength. Anything that is... There are certain things that are seen as unnatural, and then immediately, like, people go, Oh, that's wild! But it does tend to be a more visual assumption, right? The way you just might look at something that has elements of, like, big wings and teeth and monstrosity, and if you haven't been told, like, Oh, okay, that's not wild, then you might go, That's wild! So, it's more likely because Matthias, appearance-wise, like, gives off paladin knight vibes, that people would say, you've been blessed by a god. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank That's you, so well. rude. Difference between also, being blessed by a god yeah. and the wild. Rude. I know, right? Also for, like, I Someone feel like... Someone has better campaigning, that's all it is. It's true. For Kiara and, like, other people, it's just, like, is there an actual difference between Maddie at 20 strength or more? I don't know. Like, unless Maddie just starts, like, juggling her, like, oh, a volleyball, like a ball. Fucking Gaston. Tossing her into the air or shit. Like, what's the difference? Yeah. I also think, um, I'm always willing to play around with, like, little interesting games of mechanical stuff. And I haven't, like, talked to Sloane about this, but we did talk about, like, oh, you get a cool sword and maybe a curse. If a if someone was ever like, I want to make my super strength or my super intelligence mean that I can't roll below a certain number, or like I might accidentally hurt someone if I like hold them too tight, I would be very into exploring that mechanic. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, I, but I also try and be careful with that. Like I don't want me giving you a benefit to mean that you also always get a detriment. Like you have twenty two strength. You earned it. That doesn't mean that I'm going to say, like, every time you try and be gentle that you're going to break something. Because it's up to you if you want, like, a detriment like that to encourage your character or if it just feels punishing. I have been watching a show on Hulu, I think it is, about superheroes. People who, like, get their superhero capabilities at 18. I'm trying oh, to... Oh, yes. It. It's a... It's not inevitable. Uh, yeah, I, I was watching... In, in something, yeah. It, yeah. It's fun. But any uh, anyway, it has a character who gets super strength, uh, and she breaks her girlfriend's pelvis. Eve, wow, no. yeah. <laughs> like I think you know what I think it's good writing. Finger blast. What? You get it. Bone. You get it at eighteen, and it comes on without warning. Yeah, it's literally like snap. Usually comes on at 18. The main character yeah. hasn't gotten to yet. She's 25 is a big part of it. Um, and actually, I think before we go back to the the Darren question, I want to answer this next question because I'm really into it. Mm. Uh, this one is less about the world and more about table calibration. What's your advice for dealing with difficult down-to-earth concepts at a table such as Maddie's parental trauma? And I want to open up that up to you guys first. Like, how do you think our table calibration has been for talking about some of these? I, I think that a really, a good thing that I can talk from the experience of is that it's not, it's not like a you all show up at the beginning and you talk about something and then everything is perfect forever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the way that we've calibrated really effectively is creating a space where we can feel safe and honest about being like, this really fucked me up. Can we talk about it? Uh, mm. And so that's been very helpful for me. And then I think another, and this is harder to do, another thing that's really important is knowing yourself very fully and knowing things. So like, for instance, with Maddie's things in the cathedral, there were a lot of points that I had deafened myself because I knew that like there were parts that wanted to be explored and I was not equipped to deal with them. And so there are certain things where it's like, bringing conversations of things that are going to be really rough to the table and asking the other players, like, how do we feel about this? And being really on honest with the answer of like, I can handle that if I do not witness it. I can handle it if I'm not in the scene. I can't handle it. Can we keep it completely out? And like knowing all of those things and talking through them as often as possible. Yeah. And I think a big thing is also, as y'all may know, we have a pretty long green room and like, yeah, half of that is just shooting the shit because we enjoy hanging out with each other and catching up on each other's lives. 
but some some of that is also like you know this episode we're going to be kind of digging into this and these kind of themes may come up and like sarah said sometimes it's not even a i can't handle this generally it could just be an i can't handle this today yeah kind of a thing and you know like we have sometimes we know we have conversations we want to have but we have to be emotionally equipped to have them so we'll push them onto a different session because i think everyone here is committed to doing wanting to do justice to the themes we are exploring and so you know we we don't really compromise in terms of getting to things before we're ready for them like we are always willing to be patient and we're always willing to do it at a time where everyone feels safe about it mm -hmm. i think <clears throat> also having when we started the game we had our lists of you know, triggering lists, things that we can, we're green, we're yellow, we're red. I think that's very important. I remember going into a different game and going, excuse me, where's my safety list? Yeah. Because I remember, I think it was Alex that had introduced it in another game. And I was like, I'd never seen this before. This is great. Um, I haven't played as much D&D &D as everyone else. But just being like, I love bringing these safety tools in because you can just check against something. If there is a theme that you really want to dig into and you can go, wait, my friend has that. Well, I can talk to them about and see because they're a yellow. I can do that. Um, I also I also enjoy that, like Pooja said, we have our green green room beforehand, but we also have the green room after, and we check in and we do the what did we enjoy about the session? What what did we feel was a low? And we can genuinely just talk about it afterwards without any pressure. Um, and that's really good to me. It's good that we can kind of have a cool down afterwards and just especially when it was a very high emotional episode you just be like that made me feel things yeah and i need to talk about it right now <laughs> yeah. which is amazing i love it and one thing just kind of on a tangent when it comes to safety tools i've basically at this point i have a uh my pre-filled list and i have an explanatory document in the back where i talk about like more specifically what my issues are than just yeah. like the broad concept and uh, honestly, any one shot I go into any charity stream, I will be like, uh, here, are my, um, here are my safety tools. Luckily, I haven't encountered anyone who has been like, oh, no, this is a terrible idea. Like, it's always talked about because mm. that's just, I, I mean, the t kind of tables that I'm on tend to be very queer very aware of these kinds of things. And so, like, that's just welcome. But yeah, I do also highly recommend just especially because even during strange hungers we've been on for a while like things have come up which i didn't know were boundaries that have made me thought about it or i realized i'm not as concerned with some things as i thought i could be uh i i shifted around to keep it a, a living active document and that way even if you like are on a start playing game i would suggest talking to your dm because even if it's just one time you deserve to have all the fun for that mm -hmm. one time yeah and i also Oh, sorry. sorry, I was uh, going to build off something from Pooja really quickly. Yeah, go for uh, it. The RPG consent checklist is a great starting point, I think. Yeah. I've seen a lot of safety checklists lately that I am I like better that have very specific things of like, it's not just green, yellow, red. It's, I'm good with this as long as I'm not in the scene. Or I'm good with this as long as it doesn't happen to my character. I don't want this to happen at all. I don't want any scenes to happen with this. I only want it to be implied. And I think mm. going deeper into that is also very helpful safety yeah i really like the word calibration actually as applied to this uh i will say honestly that i think strange hungers has taught me so much about safety tools it is the first game that i ever streamed the first game that i ever involved like putting out content forward facing and over the process of that i've changed and adapted a lot of the ways that i handle safety stuff based on conversations that we've had moments that we've had and that sense of really recalibrating and adapting based on those moments has been amazing. Uh, honestly, I sometimes struggle with memory issues related to ADHD. And so we have multiple times like reminded each other of safety issues. We've also recalibrated our safety consent checklists multiple times in terms of like diving a little bit deeper or redetermining what our boundaries are after difficult moments. We've had a lot of conversations off stream, um, both before and after. And shifting time zones has sometimes made it more difficult to like have as much time together. So if we don't have a stream week, we will try and hop into a call just to like hang out with each other. And that's where we also have a lot of discussion about like what's coming up. 
I've also become um, much more of a person who cares about warning players ahead of time. So I mm. will bring up plot points that I think are coming up more in advance to players that I might do for like a one shot or that I've done for campaigns that were home games around a table in the past because I think the way you react to things on stream can be can just put more emotional pressure on someone than you might react to at a table when you can just kind of step away and go to the bathroom or when you really just like want the oh crazy one shot plot twist um kind of thing so warning players in advance that they have a little bit of time to prepare emotionally is a really big safety tool and it means that I think, honestly, it doesn't take away from the surprise or excitement of a plot twist. It means that players still wonder how something's going to come up or be executed, but they also are aware that they can kind of like lean into on a meta level, letting certain plot. Mm -hmm. I, one of my favorite things has been um, Alex telling us like the vague something that's going to come up and then all of us being able to come together and have like ironic lines that we say before it yeah. happens. <laughs> it's really joyful. Yeah. yeah. I, I do think that that's kind of one of the benefits of having been a table that has played together for so long is that we also have this level, like, yes, we have a level of trust with each other, but there's also like, you know, there's no fear that we're gonna, Alice is gonna say something and we're going to like meta it somehow to get around it. Um, Cause we all are just as interested in seeing what goes down. And so mm -hmm. if anything, I think it, we lean into it harder because yeah. we know there is that safety net at the end of it. And we know that it's not gonna be taken too far, which kind of is a concern when something comes up brand new, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm leaning into this, but like, you know, does, I don't want that to be like, I'm ready for this to go all the way to like, let's just say like player character death or something. Um, but knowing beforehand when, you know, Alex says this is going to be a really brutal, brutal fight, et cetera, like we can prepare ourselves mentally um, mm. because, you know, with characters <clears throat> that are so emotionally connected, you know, we've also like, just as a table discussed that um, permanent death is something that most of us cannot react to in that moment on a dime like that is a very emotional thing for characters that are so interconnected and like that's a that's like an emotional safety tool right like we, I, I don't want my character to be permanently traumatized <laughs> tiny traumas are cool and it's also good for those kinds of worries for in-person things too like things that might be going on in your life because if you're like i mean I've once had an NPC, not to like bring too much of the drama into the chat, but I, I had an NPC, major NPC character death that, that was sprung on me in one campaign two days after my aunt had died. Like I'd been Oof. in the location where she had passed and then that happened. And I was not prepared for that outside of the game, you know? So yeah. like, it's good to have those warnings to be like, am I ready for that? Because you never know what's going on in somebody's yeah. life outside of the game, even if you do have all the connection that we have kind of talking. And it gives people the space to be like, could we push that back? <laughs> yeah, yeah, not this week, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really it's really good stuff. And I, I mean, I have also said this a lot. Um, as many safety tools as you put in place, as much time as you spend talking about safety, the biggest thing that contributes to the safety of a table is communication with each other and friendship and trust in each other. And we have built that through, I mean, it's D&D, &D, right? But we've built that through hard work. We've had tough conversations. We've played together consistently. We have all put in, what are we at? Like 500 hours now, 600 hours How at this many? point, at, at least just thinking about like this game and these characters. Mm -hmm. So there is so much trust and knowledge that exists at this table and i feel very lucky to have one of those like games that is a consistent campaign that like has been happening for a long time because i feel like so many friends i talked to were like oh God, i just want to have that like high level campaign that i've been playing in for years with friends and we have it and mm -hmm. it's really special so we we've put all of our safety tools in place but we also have put in the work fucking good mm -hmm. the best uh, Sarah, did you want to go back to that Darren question? What's the Darren question? Yeah, I'll find it. Uh, Bio says, question, Darren is the best NPC in the campaign. I will, I, I won't 
ascribe to that. He's one of my favorites, but I don't want to. I don't want to rank him. He's a good he's boy, but there are boy. so many good so, like, NPCs. So many Vice good slander, excuse me. Vice exactly. Uh, how the conversation between Sarah and Osco when creating Darren? Oh God, I'm trying to honestly. I I don't think it was very exciting from what I remember. I think it was Alex. I was trying to find. I wanted this character to have some kind of interesting spellcasting focus and or familiar. And I think Alex came and was like, I can put those two together. And I was like, I'd love to see what you come up with. And then Alex came back with a really cool stat block for an animated spell book. We loosely made some character ideas from it and it went from there. I think that most of the like lore that has been established for Darren was not established be before the start of the campaign. Uh also, funny story, um, and this isn't to embarrass Sarah, but I made the animated spell block stat like forever ago, and oh I put God. it in D and D Beyond, and I linked it to their character sheet because you can link a stat block as a familiar in a character's character sheet on D and D Beyond, and then Sarah, <laughs> I showed it off on a live stream for D and D Beyond, showed thinking it off that it was a real stat block. Yes, thinking that oh it was God. not a homebrew stat block, either <laughs> a stat block that actually existed. Which is very affirming for me. Very embarrassing. Uh, but <laughs> Beautiful. All of that. All of that said, there was an interesting thing where the personality of Darren is much different than what was originally concepted because we were having Darren be like someone that like really annoyed Awaish, uh, and was just like a really annoying character in all aspects. And then their first interaction, Alex and I were both like, "Oh, they're buddies." <laughs> Oh no, they're buddies. Little guy. They're buddies. And it had to it's the way she's little guy. But I also think, I mean, I love making these little NPCs that are kind of tied into a character specifically. And the only, I would say at this point, um, each character has been getting those. And we will probably see each character eventually get one of those. So like, although Awaish has Darren, I, I love an anime. I love a sentient weapon. I love a sentient object. But we also have Agnita. And Agnita patron. and Kiara's like, patron relationship there means that I get to have a lot of these interactions that are really about a relationship that has existed either for a long time or is really significant to the build of the character. Like, mm -hmm. as a warlock. Very significant. Same thing, I think, with Titan's Wrath. It is a weapon that, even before it was sentient, was really significant to the backstory and the build of Shan's character. And as Titan's Wrath kind of becomes more significant and that bond grows, we will continue to see the way that interacting with that NPC allows the player to specifically evoke parts of the character that they want to talk about. Like when Darren and Awaish interact, Sarah gets to talk about um, some of, like, Oasis' backstory, some of the way that they feel about their family, some of the way they feel about their magic. Same thing with uh, Agnita. Pooja gets to talk about how Kiara feels about her magic, like, their divinity, their romantic relationships. Um, same thing with Titan's Wrath. I think we'll kind of see more of uh, the way that Novel is very inquisitive about history and heroism and... Um, Things like that. And then again, event, again, eventually, we now have a sentient weapon that is in Matthias's hands. I don't have, I don't have like a particular concept of what it's going to mean yet, but we know that this is in some ways a cursed blade. So uh, Sloan and I have gotten to talk a little bit about how this blade might evoke some like mentorship vibes or also like elements of history. What do you want to bring out when you talk to this blade? Right now, Hasrdal does not really have that. We have, um, we've had, like, past interactions with Valhiri, and those have, like, brought out a certain element, but I think that Tazriel developing some kind of, like, close NPC or weapon or psionic connection will probably exist. And one of the things we have vaguely mentioned is the idea that, um, that NPC we saw in the prison, that mental connection that was made, if VJ wanted at some point to go like warlock or have some kind of patronage, that could be an NPC that could have that kind of relationship. I'm so excited for that. Yeah. Shit. It's so good. Um, but yeah, I think we are probably going to wrap up soon-ish. I, 
I do want to make sure we all get that chance for lunch, and there was meant to be a little chat. So is there anything else that y'all wanted to say or mention as we wrap up? Hmm. I think I did. What? <laughs> uh, but... The last two <laughs> comments about Kiara. <laughs> <sighs> Listen, uh, Kiara contains multitudes. So many multitudes. Deep um, insight also and also an appreciation for titties. I also <laughs> contain those multitudes. Yeah. Look, it's it's a very good <laughs> motion. Um, I um, also do want to say thank you, Vo, for the compliment about my. my yeah, life. it's very sweet. I, uh, I was going to read I, it, but I thought. I've done a lot of um, poetry and writing, and also slam poetry, and I think that that. I don't have as an improv background, but I think that um, that's probably contributed to it. But it's also very sweet, and I will mm -hmm. also point to all of my players in terms of the way they've blown me away with lines and conversations that they've had, and especially things that they've said that at the time they didn't know related to like themes or stuff I was going to bring up, and then just came out perfectly on theme for the campaign or like predicted something that was going to happen. So I am truly blessed to have just like brilliant people that I'm surrounded with as well. I kind of want to go back and like, oh, you have a quote sections. I need to, I need to see this because I want to sometimes go back and listen and like fast forward past my own voice for my own issues. But like, yes, there are just, I feel like also as time has gone on and I, I have, you know, we've experienced more things in the world. Like I want to go back and see how things were foreshadowed, how things like, yeah. Link. It's like when you when you first emerge, you're just like, okay, but is this connected? And then you are vindicated and like, yes, that was a thing. I'm not insane and I'm not just I thinking it. about it. Yeah. But also like, you know, I we started out, this I, need. Yeah. yeah. I was too busy trying to like learn all of your playing styles and like, you know, yeah. like, I came mm. in not knowing anyone at this table, uh, having played with nobody. So like there was, there was a lot more like so wild to imagine. Newbie energy mm. where I was like, kind crazy. of more focused on that and where like the character fit more. And so like, I probably did not absorb as much of the, uh, what was going on on a, on a more um, grander meta scale. So I feel like uh, I want to go and kind of go back in mm. now that I have my comfort in the world, like revisit mm the macro themes that have been present throughout that I may have missed because I was so focused on, oops, sorry. I was so focused on something else during the episode. We definitely have a lot of foreshadowing for novel that was very fun. Um like I was so excited. Play. I was just so excited to work with Alex and be like, okay, but can we put this here? And like, oh, oh, do you think we could do that? And th then we could put this here and just coming from like someone who does a lot of narratives, I was just so excited uh, about it. I will also well, say I did not expect this, but by God, Pooja, you are the slowest roller I have ever known. Like, you, the amount of PR reveals that we have planned that you have not dropped still are That's crazy. So crazy. I was going to say, you're talking about plotting with Alex for slow reveals. Like, I'm pretty sure we have been slowly seeding things from the very beginning, from the literal beginning. So sexy. That, has, yeah. that have not dropped yet. It's tight. I love Give me. it. I want it, it. It's coming. It is coming. We have decided that it's it, it's time. Because, okay. Kara got stuff like three or four levels ago that has not manifested yet. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Give me. Give me. I want it. Also, it. <laughs> it's not like, it is not my player's fault. Um, I consistently have underestimated how much time it would take to do plot things, which always <laughs> happens in D&D. But we also there do were dumb shit all the time. We do dumb shit. <laughs> but I've also said, like, there are things I would like for you to wait to reveal until you get to the waste because I want the characters mm. to have known each other for, like, a few weeks, a month. Like, you know, things... Give them a chance to get to know each other. So it is not my player's fault. That and that's not a... a year. That's not a judgmental Jesus Christ. No, that's a no. Jesus Christ of anticipation. I'm to yeah. be fair, this is also not Alex's fault because when we talked about when would be the right play to reveal it. The wastes was always the answer. Right. So, because the reveals that we want, like, we've thought about them a specific way. We've thought about, like, what circumstances need to happen, and I think they just make more sense. So, mm. uh, 
Yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I'm also <laughs> glad that we are now in a place where everyone in the party is in pretty good standing with one another. Like, uh, that's just nice for a large yeah. character reveals. And, yeah. and I'm excited for that because there are some things that like I've revealed above table, but like maybe one of the party members knows, zero of the party members knows. And so like, those are things that I don't want to reveal to the party until everyone's in good standing. And I feel like mm. we're achieving that really, really well now, mm. which is great. So. Also very important for personal selfish drama reasons, because mm -hmm. like, what's the way to make a very dramatic impact with reveals have everybody invested? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. It's kind of more fun to, I mean, I think we all really enjoy the drama of like, no, I can't believe that all this time. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of more fun to do it if you like are friends and then you can also go back to being friends. Cause if you're working on having the characters like each other and connect and there's something that drives them further apart, that can be tough. Like you still mm -hmm. want to role play it out, but mm -hmm. maybe you're looking forward to them you know, holding hands. So. Like, like with, again, that's it. Like me and VJ talking about future has a novel being friends again. It's just like, we have to get through this. We have to, you know, we, ha we have to actually get, get them back to talking to each other. I'm really excited to get through that. And it's not even a, not even a slog. It's like, I'm excited for them to make these connections again and yeah. for their friendship to be stronger. It's good. Good. I'm just excited. Me too. Good. Yeah. I love you guys. Stronger. Stronger. I love you guys. <laughs> cool. Um, all right. I think I'll probably wrap us up there then. Um, thank mm. you so much, Sloan, for helping us. Yeah. Helping oh, us to uh, everyone send good healing vibes to Sloan. Mm hmm. Ooh. Yes. Illness and June a... is homophobic. Very homophobic. Oh, I'm Pride nice Month. Little, little Pride. Pride Month. Uh, happy yeah. Pride Month. Happy Pride, Pride. Pride. This. I mean, I think we all know it, but this has always been a all queer, gay as hell stream campaign and network. So let your gay characters kiss this month as a treat. Yes, let them kiss. Yeah. They deserve it. All right. <laughs> Line up. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Love you guys so much. Thanks for being oh, here. I just made the stream ah! go crazy. Sorry oh, about that. Oh, that oh, was wild. Too many Alexes. <laughs> There are a lot of Alex's. <laughs> Sorry. We're <laughs> all the GM now. No worries. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. <laughs>